Welcome, everybody. My name is Steve McCord. I'm the founder and the chairman of the board for Procedure Solutions Management. And I am over the top excited today about trying to introduce something to you that I mean, has really caught my attention and so much so that I wanted to share it with all of you. And, and I'd be, love to get your feedback on this. And what I'm going to do is I developed a presentation uh, with my uh, guest here, uh, uh, Stu Goose from uh, Deep Howe. Um, who we have uh, actually signed a partnership agreement with uh, with this because we are so excited about this technology that I think is going to be a huge change for industry overall. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right into this and try to help build my case and, and try to help you see what I saw. And I would really be interested in the feedback if you kind of see the same things and, and what your thoughts are. And so let's go ahead and we'll get right into this. Uh, let's go ahead and get right into this as we have here. And here we go. So here it is. So the title of this Launch and Learn is called The Procedure Writing in a Digital Age. All right. And so as we move through forward here, I hit the next screen. And so here is my problem statement. As the workforce is changing, the needs of the workforce also change and drive the tools and technology needed to continually support and improve human performance. Now, communication tools have evolved since the beginning of time. Although the rate of change today is, is unprecedented, and if not kept up, could lead to significant human performance challenges if they do not remain aligned with the needs of the workforce. Industry leadership and regulatory compliance agencies must recognize that the tools that assisted the workforce for many years and their successful performance does not mean that those tools are going to be the best fit for today. So, so that's the main problem statement of what I'm trying to address. So now I'll come back to this next thing. So this presentation will discuss some of the latest advances designed to lower the risk of task-based performance errors through the use of human-factored procedures and instructions and step-by-step how-to videos. Now, these tools will collectively provide a profound leap forward in improving human performance by enhancing the management of knowledge-based performance. Now, as a little plug for our next Lunch and Learn, and the next Lunch and Learn, I'll have another key, uh, key guest there that will build upon this even further as we get into discussions on animated 3D graphics and things of that nature also to be added to procedures and helping to improve human performance. So stay tuned for the next one when you start seeing some discussions on that. So first, we talk about human performance. And I just want to cover a lot of this quickly because I want to give maximum amount of time uh, to Stu to go ahead and do his presentation. So we talked about human performance. What does that really mean? By definition, it's the system of processes, values, behaviors. Ultimately, it's the results that determine performance. But even more so, when you think about the principles of human performance, there's this constant fight in industry between our competency, uh, skill of the craft, and, and those the core knowledge that we bring to our jobs. But then as a tipping point or a balancing point on that, despite all the knowledge that we bring to our jobs to help make the jobs perform safely, is we have to recognize that people do make mistakes. Matter of fact, those mistakes are actually predictable. Organizations can influence behavior. Those behaviors can be reinforced and accidents and events are avoidable. So let's, let's look at a couple of really quick statistics. These came right from OSHA's website, right? So if you go to the Occupational Safety Health Administration, which is a government agency that oversees all occupational hazards for in, working, in the work environment, you think about it, Many of you started your day off today just like you start off typically normal any other day. A couple, a couple of cups of coffee, maybe a Red Bull. You know, you start the floor. The world's good. It's a perfectly sunny day. Everything is great, you know. And by the end of the day, there was over 19,000 people in a seven-year period there that went home with one less body part, Right. There's over 60,000 people on that same time frame that by the end of the day, they ended up in the hospital. Cars still out there in the parking lot. Someone's trying to figure out how they're going to get their car back to their house, you know. And then on top of that, from 2017 to 2021, 
there was over 25,000 people that just that today was the last day of work, right? Matter of fact, in 2021, there was a worker that died every 101 minutes in 2021. That, that to me is mind boggling, right? So obviously the statistics that I showed on the previous slide are pretty true, right? People do make mistakes and error is predictable. OSHA's trending it for Pete's sake, right? So now when you and I perform work, any of us, I don't care what area of the world that you work in, whether you're in India, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, Malaysia, Guyana, doesn't matter where you are. For every single task we perform, there are three performance modes that we can move through, right? And from one step to the next step, they're called skill-based, rule-based, and knowledge-based. Now, as depicted on the following slide, each of these performance modes comes with its own level of human performance risk, okay? Now, as Prashiga writers or reviewers, one of our primary responsibilities is to develop steps with the lowest level of human perform risk. That's why I, I got so excited by this new technology, uh, coupled with uh, the technology that we've had for years and the fact of writing human factor procedures. But it's another tool in the toolbox that collectively, either independently or working together with written instructions, can help lower the risk even further and even further. So, the three, if you look at each one of these risk levels, you can see that they have their own. You can Google this. You can so this isn't just something that Steve McCord is making up, but you can Google this and you can actually look and say, all right, well, skill-based. Normally to be in skill-based, they're saying that that's a task that has to be something that has less than seven steps. And it's something that you have performed repeatedly, repeatedly greater than 50 times. And if you meet that, then you can say, all right, well, you're in skill base and you have a one in a 1,000 to one in 10,000 error rate potential with it, right? Now, for years, I used to think and say, well, you know, I have over 40 years of industrial experience. I'm very skilled. It's not what skill base means, right? And then when you go into the human factor procedure area of things, you look at it and say, all right, now I have these rule-based instructions that are supplementing my knowledge and collectively between what I know and this document that I can use collectively together, that when I do that, I'm in rule base. And when I'm in rule base, I have a one in 100 to one in 1,000 chance of screwing something up, right? Or you go into what we call knowledge base. Now, knowledge base means one thing is that you're using your own internal knowledge to complete a test. Someone gives you a phone call, calls you on the radio, and says, Steve, I need you to do this thing. All right, Sarah, I got this. I'm going to go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. I go out to the field. I started performing the task all from my memory. You're a knowledge base. Or let's say you have a written instruction that's written very poorly. It has all kinds of questions like, you know, if required, do this. If necessary, do this. Slowly open the valve. Stop the pump before the level gets too low. Well, they're all open-ended sentences or steps that you have to use your own core knowledge to fill in the blank. If you do, look at the error rate. It's between one and two, which is a flip of a coin, the one and 10, right? Now, there's many, many things that we do in knowledge base. Overall, the thing that we're trying to accomplish in developing human factor instructions is we want to make sure the quality of those procedures support skill-based and rule-based performance. Workers should, notice it says should, should never be in knowledge base when executing procedures, right? If the worker finds themselves in a knowledge base mode where the document lacks adequate detail, it's unclear, it's unsafe, just doesn't work, it's expected that the worker is going to know to stop the job and contact their supervisor for, for support. Now, knowledge base mistakes result from what we would say trial and error. In these cases, even though you were expected to go perform a certain task, and you think you know everything that you need to know to go perform that test, in all reality, you may have insufficient knowledge about how to perform that test, and it results in the development of a solution that's incorrectly expected to work, okay? Now, why should we care? Because ultimately, when developing procedures or instructions, what we want to do is manage knowledge-based performance. Again, we want to manage this. We're not trying to get rid of it. There's many, many things we do in knowledge-based, and that's expected. Now, there was this famous quote that came out there and it says, hey, look, I, what I want to try to do is kind of lead into the discussion with Stu. And the idea here is, is that if we want 
if you want the present to be different from the past, we need to study the past. So let's look at the communication or procedures and where it came from, right? So on the following slides, here are some key notes that I want you to understand. First off, we need to understand that procedures and instructions are or should be considered a major communication tool, right? Now, I hope that you'll see here is notice how the forms of communication have changed over time, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And then also notice how the rate of change is occurring more rapidly today than in any other time period in history, okay? Now, this presentation is not a sales ploy. I'm not trying to do that. This is meant to be an educational experience for all of us. I'm just sharing it with this epiphany, this light bulb moment that I had from all the work that we do with all our many clients and investigative work and assessments and things. I'm sharing this presentation based on what PSM is witnessing as a company that are resulting in challenges to human performance. This should be a wake-up call as we are seeing a serious divergence in the communication tools that have been developed, deployed by industry over time and required by regulatory agencies as compared to what is needed today to support the more uh, modern workforce, right? Now, so let's go back. Let's make sure we understand history. Primitive times, over 30,000 years ago, we started drawing pictures on cave walls, right? And that's the oldest known, and these symbols were considered a communication tool that we like, you know, we discovered today and, oh, look what we found. And then you see it on the news and how they found these artifacts inside the caves. And that was 30,000 years ago. It's considered a graphic communication system, followed by about 20,000 years ago, all of a sudden people decided, you know what? Instead of painting them on the walls inside a cave, let's start carving this into a rock and let's go ahead and, and, and it'll, it'll be there forever. And so all of a sudden you see where there's all into these productions of carvings on rocks and things. And, and that was a big form of communication, right? 20,000 years ago. Then it, then it evolved in what they call pictograms and, and pictograms are considered the symbol that was intended to represent a concept, an object, an activity, a place, or even, you know, even a, an event that occurred. And they started doing that. And so pictograms were used by various ancient cultures all over the world since around 9,000 to about 5,000 BC, right? Then that kind of evolved into what they call ideograms. And these are pictures that turned into graphic symbols. It's almost kind of like our, um, icons and things that we have today, emojis. Think about that, there's a good emoji. And so what happens is their ancestors and the pictograms could represent only something representing their form. And so that you'll have, you know, how do you represent the sun, but not concepts like heat, a light, day, or the great God of the sun, right? So uh, autograms on the other hand could convey more abstract concepts. And so you can see the picture of one here, right? Now, additionally, that then evolved into writing. Early scripts, 26th century BC, was one of the earliest examples of human writing. The alphabet was created in 2000 BC in ancient Egypt. Another uh, big source of communication was storytelling. And they talk about how people communicate things through songs and poems and chants. And all these things were a form of communication, right? And then now let's, let's look at the timeline of things, right? So as you go through all the timeline, notice that paper was um, introduced in the Muslim world around 751. The quill was invented and started using in 1250, right? Followed by the Johannesburg Gutenberg Press, the printing press with metal movable type, 1440, right? And then the first photocopier for office use was 1958, 1958, right? Then the first full-scale television commercial, 1947, Sirius Satellite Radio, 1999, right? Then you get in here, the first email was sent in 1965. Some of us may remember the eight-inch floppy disk, right? 1971. The personal computer, 1976. For some of us in the procedure writing world, Microsoft Word is launched in 1983, right? Then you have um, the uh, World Wide Web 
1989. Then you have Word Perfect 5.1. And then Lotus Notes, for some of us to go back that time, they were ball of 1989, right? And then all of a sudden you get YouTube 2005, right? The iPhone is launched in 2007. So now you go into the commercial nuclear grade, right? 1976, the ANSI N187 and ANSI 3.2 required the preparation of procedures to carry out effective quality assurance program things. They created Appendix A in that document that lists pages of here's all the different procedures by title that to go from uh, construction to commercial operation you had to basically show that you had these books on the shelf and that you could use these things, right? Section 5.3.2 then came out and it basically gave some guidelines to say, hey, excluding any discussion on formatting, it talked about procedures should have a title, uh, applicability statement, kind of like your purpose and scope, you know, references, prereqs, and notice all the criteria. That was a 1976 that that came out, right? Now, then we get into, in the year 2003, MPO, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, came out with a rev zero of this, of this document called, uh, it was like a standard for processes and procedures. It was later re, uh, handed off, the ownership was handed off to the Nuclear Energy Institute, and it was called NEI AP90701, which is like a procedure change process. In 2006, the uh, NIMSL, the Nuclear Information Management Strategic Leadership, char was chartered to actually develop the first human factor writing guidance for the nukes. And that developed into AP 90705. So this we're, we're talking 2006, right? Now, that then spurned off and created an organization called the Procedure Professionals Association. And if you look at their timeline, they created the kind of 1988 in 2006, they got a handoff from NEI and said, hey, you guys can own these standards. And then they've kind of continued on from there. So the point that I want to make was look at how communication has changed over 30,000 years. But now notice the rate of change. So if you look at the red line as it carries on to the next column in there, Look how things have transpired from 1947 until deep out here in 2018, compared to all the things that occurred from the 30,000 BC to 1440, when the Gutenberg press started printing stuff out on a press. Look at how all the change between YouTube and Facebook and all these different things that have occurred, the iPhone and procedure solutions management in 2008, right? And all these different things. So the change of technology is coming fast and ferocious, but are we keeping up with it? Is the worker, to, is today's worker aligned with today or are they aligned with the 1976 version of the guidance that was out there for the standards, right? And so that's what I wanna leave you with. There's the thought. So here we've transpired over these years, and now all of a sudden, here we are, and we're in 2023. And now I'm going to introduce to you my special guest. And uh, our partner in here is uh, Mr. Stuart Goose, Dr. Goose. If, if, and there you go. And I'll go ahead and then I'll stop sharing and I'll turn this over to you. And thanks, Stu, for being here. Well, thank you very much for the generous introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Um, don't let my funny accent confuse you. Um, I, I was raised in England, but I'm talking to you from uh, Berkeley, California today. Um, so Steve really built this up very well. So I hope I can live up to, to the expectation seeing Deep Power <laughs> listed with all of those impressive companies. Um, so. At Deep Howl, we, we are equally excited to be partnering with PSM. So thank you very much. Uh, and when I met Steve a handful of months ago, um, we were um, also very uh, impressed with um, the commitment of PSM to this type of work. And, and we share 
also the passion and and, and also the importance of, of the work that you do, Steve, and your team. So much so that immediately uh, I signed up for Steve's procedure writing course and, and passed that. So uh, that, that was my first introduction. Uh, he was a, a great teacher. So um, today, what I'd like to do is take uh, maybe the next um, 25, 30 minutes to give you an introduction to Deep How. Um, so Deep How, um, I'm going to first go through um, an introduction, tell you about the origin of the company, what the motivation, what caused us to uh, to, to create Deep How. Um, but I think Steve's given you a pretty good hint there. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the positioning. Obviously, many of you, if you're devotees of PSM, you create your work instructions using the, the guidelines that Steve um, proudly espouses. So we're going to talk about how we'll enrich, how that can be enriched with step-by-step uh, -step multilingual videos. Then I'll give you a, a quick overview of, of Deep How, the platform, and um, the rationale for why it was built that way. We are uh, a video-centric company. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why we think that that's important and the value of video. We're also an AI company. Um, I'm sure you probably, like everybody else, been reading the press about AI, um, but I'm going to make AI very concrete in this context. So we have what we call the flavor of UI, uh, AI, which is human-centered AI, and it's in the service of the human. And then we'll end this with a, a quick demo of one, uh, one aspect of Deep How. We won't have time to do the entire platform justice, but at least it will give you a flavor. And um, if that interests you, we'd love to continue the conversation and, and share more. Uh, so with that, so why did we begin Deep How five years ago? And who are these people that created Deep How? Well, we're not a bunch of 25-year-old Silicon Valley software engineers. Um, we are, in fact, you can tell if you look closely, I have some graying temples here. Um, so we are experienced um, former employees of Siemens. You may be familiar with the, the international uh, company, German Heritage, that has, um, has its roots in industry, automation, healthcare, and energy. So I, I, you, you've possibly seen the, the name and the products in that context. So we, we um, learned a lot, met lots of customers in lots of industries, you know, automation, energy, healthcare, pulp and paper, chemical, got a wide exposure to the needs and the challenges of those different industries. And what we saw is that um, automation of machines were doing very well, but we also thought that more could be done to serve the humans that control and operate and work with these uh, automation uh, machines and infrastructures. Um, and here you can also see, oops, sorry. Here you can also see a number of trends which perhaps you're experiencing uh, in your industry, in your company. You know, industry 4.0, or some people are saying these days 5.0. So this is smart machines coupled with the humans. Um, so various companies are in their journey along this uh, digital transformation path. And we think that Deep How um, and video SOPs, um, sorry, if you're not familiar, standard operational procedures or SOPs, these are one e easy way to get started on your digital transformation journey. We're also seeing the aging workforce, um, experts who are in you know, the, the later part of their career, but they have developed such uh, competence, uh, expertise and skills, and maybe their employers haven't fully captured um, all of that expertise before these people begin to retire. So, um, also, as those people are retiring, they need to be replaced with, uh, with the next generation of, of workers. And 
We're seeing that the, the younger generation of workers perhaps learn in a different way to uh, the older generation, you know, my generation, maybe Steve's generation, we learned with books, textbooks. Um, but the younger generation, you know, they, they're quite happy to pick up their phone, do some searching, watch some online videos and uh, learn very quickly and efficiently that way. So these are two trends that uh, Deep Power are also tapping into. How do we capture that knowledge from the experienced workers and present it or share it, serve it up in a way that the younger generation find more compelling um, in order to learn from? And you can also see, you know, you've probably seen these headlines as well. Here's one that I clipped from CNN that various vertical industries um, are really struggling to hire, hire young people. Um, so we, we've got to find a way to um, uh, attract, um, recruit, keep them interested, provide them tools and ways to learn in the ways that they will enjoy and feel um, compelled and, and interested to learn more. So the, the sum total of all of these trends is why we um, started Deep Helm. We think that we have a technology that can help address uh, a number of these issues. So let's have a look here. Um, a number of you may be familiar with uh, different ways of, of teaching and learning, right? Um, instructional manuals we talked about before, classroom training, um, job shadowing. These are all great ways of training and they certainly won't go away and Deep Power is not trying to make them obsolete. But we think that we have a way that can help uh, teach and, and share know-how that's perhaps a little bit more scalable and a bit more effective. And our, our customers, which have really valued Deep Power and, and adopted it with, um, with great vigor, happen to be the ones that have already recognized the power of video for teaching and sharing know-how, but that were struggling to do that at scale. So they've already recognized that capturing a video of an expert performing a, a fluid uh, manual task, showing the dexterity and the movement um, of how you accomplish a certain task with your hands or your tools, um, there's no better way of communicating that than with a video, but trying to do that for every single SOP, and some of our customers have thousands of these SOPs, trying to do that at scale with just a handful of people who know how to capture um, and edit videos just isn't cutting it. So Deep How is, uh, is, is a tool that they're really embracing and we'll talk about how um, in order to serve that need. How do we make thousands of these SOP videos and share it across our multinational companies? Some people um, also say, well, augmented reality and virtual reality, aren't, aren't these also technologies for the future? Of course, of course they are. And when uh, the Deep How team were at Siemens, we also did lots of research. We, we were part of corporate research, some of us. And we investigated augmented reality and virtual reality too. But what we concluded is that it's still very expensive to create a high quality uh, AR and VR learning environment. And they often have to be custom made, which makes it cost prohibitive. Plus, if you add on the cost of and uh, augmented reality glasses like HoloLens or, or a VR goggles, you know, it, it takes it out of the reach of many customers. So what, what we decided is that almost everybody and their dog these days has a smartphone or some kind of smart device. Almost every generation knows how to take videos these days, you know, whether it's of the grandchildren, of the dog, whatever. People know how to take videos. So by leveraging the ubiquity of these devices and people's willingness to capture content. We've tried to build a tool which um, is cost-effective, 
and helps people to um, assist them in the editing and the publishing uh, process. So this is how we got to this point um, on this quadrant. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about the platform. So the, the tagline for DeepHow is we're AI powered, and we'll get to what that means. We're video centric for the reasons that I just uh, explained on the previous slide. We are software as a service company, which many of you are probably familiar with this term, but essentially it means that we have a lot of the deep how technology resides in the cloud and is powered in the cloud, but that you interact with deep how via a number of uh, applications, which I'll explain along the bottom here. So software as a service, which um, for the end customer means it's very convenient. There's no real on-premise deployment um, intricacies that you have to be worried about. It's very easy to deploy deep how. And we're focused on um, training for skilled workers. So primarily people that do jobs with their hands, with their tools. You can also record uh, screen captures as well, because what we found is that um, sometimes uh, a deep power video requires some part of the workflow to be with tools and hands, but sometimes you need to capture um, part of a computer screen, whether it's fulfilling some kind of SAP uh, workflow uh, on the computer, or whether it's interacting with a PRC or some kind of HMI. So DeepHow can serve um, uh, to, to fulfill all of those aspects. So let me tell you a little bit more. So we have uh, a DeepHow cloud here, which you can see. Um, we have our own um, Siri or Alexa, she's called Stephanie. We'll talk more about Stephanie later. And then along the bottom, here are the applications that as an end user, you would interact with DeepHow via. Now as a video platform, it probably won't surprise you that there is an application that is devoted to helping you capture uh, or record and then seamlessly upload the video of the expert performing their task, upload that video to the Deep How Cloud. Then um, once you've walked back to your desk from the shop floor or wherever you've captured your video, you can then use your web browser to then um, have AI Stephanie assist you in editing and publishing that video. And then um, because it's a video, once the video has been published, you need a way to be able to watch that video. So that's what the, uh, the navigator is here. It's, it's our version of the video player. So again, recording, editing, playing. So these are the three core applications of DeepHow. And we also have uh, a skills manager here because you may choose to um, create a new skill. Um, let's make one up like, welding 101 for example right and you may have two or more deep house skills that you wish to put together to create like a mini curriculum for how to accomplish a certain skill so this allows you to um, to essentially make a little playlist of deep power workflows and then you can assign that to individuals or to teams and then you can track their progress in acquiring that skill Okay, and then lastly, we have an analytics dashboard which allows you to, um, as an administrator, see which of your employees have watched which videos and when. So that's a, a, a very quick summary of the platform. So what I'd like you to take away from this is that DeepHow is an end-to-end -end solution. So everything from capturing all the way through to publishing and viewing and offering skills, right? So I have a few slides here that will go into more detail in, into all of the applications. Now I'm gonna skip over those, but they're just here in the deck if you wish to 
see which features uh, each of those applications have. So as I mentioned, this is an end-to-end -end application, uh, an end-to-end -end platform. And what we're trying to do here, much in the same way as uh, Steve and his colleagues um, teach you how to write um, human factored procedures. Once Steve has taught you or taught you to fish, he wants you to then go and catch your own fish, right? So that you can go and write your own procedures. And again, this is what we want to do at Deep Howl. What we're, we're offering here is a set of tools which democratizes or makes it much easier for everybody in the organization to be able to pick up an iPhone or an Android phone and capture, edit, and publish their own procedures. Of course, we would like to provide some examples of best practice, how you um, record and edit um, high quality video SOPs. And, and we'll, we'll come back to that point later. Um, but we really, the, the goal is for you to go and be able to do this yourself, okay? So much like with TikTok and Instagram, you know, everybody these days is a creator, um, but that's on the social media side, but we want to, um, you know, enable everybody to be a creator within the industrial world as well. Okay. So hopefully that's told you why deep how, um, why video, um, a little bit about the products, and now we'll get to why AI. So over the past, let's say, uh, the last eight years or so, so AI um, technologically has made tremendous progress. Um, but what we want to do within um, Deep How is, is leverage that for the benefit of our customers here. So what we've taken um, many of the smarts and the innovations that the research community has come up with, and we've put it to service in the context of making video SOPs. And <clears throat> in particular, in the service of anyone that's recording, anyone that's editing, and anybody that's trying to find a particular video SOP. So let me give you one concrete example. So if any of you have ever um, had the opportunity to have to create a high quality video, you will know it's not a cakewalk. Um, it can be very time consuming. So for example, if you're going to make a, a professional video that you're going to share internationally, these are a number of the steps that you have to go through in order to create a high quality video. And this is what we observed uh, in some of our customers that were trying to do this themselves. And we actually timed um, one of our customers uh, how long it took them to produce just one high quality video SOP. And it was five hours because they had to go through all of these steps. Now with Deep Howl, we equipped the same worker who it took five hours with Deep Howl and we said, now do your task again. And we recorded him and it took him the same task, took him 20 minutes. So we saw you know, like a 10x productivity improvement for equipping um, these types of customers with deep how tools. And this is largely because we were able to combine the power of AI in order to do some of the, let's call it the more labor intensive or grunt work um, associated with video editing and, and publishing and, and provide proposals um, as to um, how to perform these particular edits and enrichments of the video. So let me just take you through this. So the, the, the different steps of creating a video um, can involve capturing the subtitles. Now, Deep Howl does that automatically. Once you've recorded your video, 
DeepHelm um, automatically pre-processes it and extracts a complete transcription of the expert that's narrating the task as they're performing it, right? The next step, if you're providing a step-by-step -step SOP, is you want to break the video into each of these discrete steps. DeepHow does that automatically. So we have um, uh, models that we run that we call a, a multimodal analysis, which look for um, semantic similarity in the narration of the expert. So they're looking for similar phrasing and words um, so that we can cluster topics in order to provide a proposal to the editor. Oh, maybe you want to segment it here, here, and here. And then finally, um, in the enrichment phase, if you need to do any language translation, um, so maybe your workforce um, is, is very multilingual, you know, Spanish speakers, French speakers, German speakers, Deep Power can do automatic language translations for you. And there's a whole host of other things that Deep Power does. But this is just to say that it, it's carefully thought out how the AI can really help you to be more effective. Okay. Um, so we're at 9, 40, uh, 45 minutes through the hour. So what I'm going to do now is I'll skip to a demo and show you what the Deep How player looks like. We won't have time to look at how to edit a video, but maybe we can, um, for those of you that are interested to learn more, um, we've uh, whetted your appetite enough. We'll be happy to, to talk more about that on another occasion. But let me switch to a live demo and I can show you the Deep How player. Um, actually, I'm not sure I shared my audio when I shared my screen, so there we go. Okay. All right, so what I'm gonna show you now is um, a video of a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so this gentleman here, he's providing some training on how to um, inspect and perform some routine maintenance on various aspects of this wastewater treatment plant. Um, so we'll use that as the context, but what I'm gonna do is show you some, some different features here in the player, okay? So you'll recognize some of these features because it's, uh, um, it, it's a video player. Um, I'm just checking, Steve, can you see my screen, okay? Yeah, all right. Now, <clears throat> so here's the play button. You know, here are some reactions. You can do, you know, likes and comments, uh, things like this. Um, a couple of things that I wanna tease out which are different to your regular video player is if I roll over here on what looks like this bullet list, you can see this video has been segmented or this workflow has been segmented into 19 different steps. So AI Stephanie during the editing process helped us to, um, do this segmentation, this intelligent segmentation. Now this means that this video can be easily used by both newbies and experts alike. A newbie can watch it start to finish. An expert will just be able to come in here and say, oh yeah, how do I, um, how do I lubricate the points on the Lovejoy connection? And they can just click on step 14 and go straight to that, right? There are also other ways that I'll show you to help you get uh, quickly to your information. Um, so this is the segmentation part. Um, I talked about language translation. Um, so actually, let's just do that. Let's go to inside here. Normally this has this cover on it. Um, it's one of your lubrication points. Uh, you can see the lubrication point here, but what I wanted to show you here. Okay. So a couple of things to notice at first. Um, this video, typically you'll see it's focused on what the um, worker is doing with their hands and their tools. It's not really focused on their face. We're less interested in that, right? It's how do I get the job done? You'll also notice here that there are subtitles. Subtitles are important for a number of reasons, right? One is that um, 
you know, sometimes the worker when they're watching this video is in a noisy environment and they can't always hear um, the spoken track of the audio. So sometimes reading the subtitles is, is, is a valuable addition, right? Um, however, it's important to have the audio as well because maybe somebody's not so good at reading and they would rather listen to the spoken narration. Another um, positive aspect for having the subtitles is we can easily switch at any point to another language, um, to French, to German, is this is your Lovejoy connection inside here. Okay, so we can instantly make this video um, internationalized. And believe me, our customers spend an awful lot of money on translations and deep how this one feature alone, they find almost pays for itself. Uh, so subtitles are, are, are really, really useful in this context. Now also let me show you, um, you can do some searching. So down here is the magnifying glass. So there's a couple of different ways you can do searching. So one of the AI services that we have built into the platform, when you publish your video, it automatically um, extracts key terms. And this is, this is uh, also another very valuable um, aspect to Deep House. So what we've learned over the years is that different vertical industries have different vocabularies. So for example, one of our big customers is Anheuser-Busch, the guys that brew beer. So you can imagine the vocabulary that expert use, use when they uh, describe beer brewing is very different to um, Stanley Black & Decker when they're talking about power tools, which is very different to Ford when they're talking about automotive. Very different to Sanger Bam when they're talking about chemical production. And what Deep Power does over time, because it's built on an adaptive AI foundation, is that it's able, um, as it receives more videos uploaded, it's able to learn the, uh, the, the phrases as they're used more frequently um, for that particular vertical industry. So it becomes smarter and more attuned to that vocabulary. So here we can see a number of um, terms that have been extracted. So if I click on this one, Bolt. So here you can see all the times where the expert mentions Bolt. And if I click on this, it will take me directly to the point in the video where Bolt is mentioned in the context. Um, I don't have to use one of those key terms. I could type in something of my own. So I could say um, wire. There you go. So this is where wire is mentioned. So it makes finding the information that you want just very much more efficient, right? So if we contrast this with YouTube, for example, um, why is Deep How different from YouTube? Well, Deep How, as I explained earlier, it's an end-to-end -end system, right? All the way from capture to edit to publish to, to helping you search and search with intelligence. Deep uh, YouTube by contrast, it's just a, a video platform that you can upload to. Deep How is also enterprise focused. We work with large international customers that care about their proprietary workflows being protected and secure. Contrast that with YouTube, it's a public facing uh, video platform uh, that is not really suited for that. And at the risk of um, talking for too long, maybe I should just stop there and leave enough time for Q&A. There are two questions for you, Sue, in the Q&A. Um, yes. So the first one is uh, from Stephen Fleshman. Um, he asked, how does this communicate with a training program to document and record and maintain records of training receipts? Excellent question. Um, so lots of our customers, Stephen, I think your name was, um, they also have a learning management systems and um, Deep How, uh, we have a number of different ways that we can integrate and complement um, those learning management systems. So for example, one of our customers has, um, for want of a better work, a, 
uh, want of a better word, a, a blog-like application where they write their procedures uh, text-based. But what they wanted to use DeepHow for was to complement their text-based explanations. So DeepHow can be embedded, a DeepHow video can be embedded within um, their uh, web-based SOP uh, framework very easily, you know, much like perhaps you've um, inserted a video into LinkedIn, or maybe you've inserted a YouTube video into Facebook. You can do exactly the same thing with Deep Power. You can insert uh, videos to complement your text. Um, there's also a bunch of different ways that we have for integrating with other systems, whether that be through a public uh, API or whether it's a custom integration. So happy to go into more detail with you on this, but we have, well, we've done this several times over now. Um, okay, and I have another question from Christina, uh, who said, have you found any issues with the translations? For example, when someone uses an application like Google Translate, it often mistranslates. Yeah, so that, that's a, a great question as well. Now you can imagine as a small company, um, like Deep Howl, we're not, it, it, it doesn't um, serve us well to try and reinvent something from the ground up. So we do indeed stand on the shoulders of some of the larger players that already have um, speech recognition or language translation engines. However, the value add that Deep Howl brings to the table is, as I explained earlier, because we're an AI platform, when uh, over time, um, Deep How will learn the vocabulary for a specific vertical industry. And the example I gave was beer brewing, right? Because Anheuser-Busch has been our customer now for multiple years. AI Stephanie has learned more about the terminology of beer brewing than Google or Microsoft are able to do so. So this is where Deep How adds that smart contextual layer and being able to understand what it means to recognize and then translate those terms well. Um, so next question from Sandy. Uh, Sandy said, amazing technology, does it have offline support? Um, offline in the sense of um, what we do have is, say for example, a video has been published that you need to view and review, say when you're down in a mine, and you have no internet connectivity. So what we, we do provide is um, we have mobile apps um, and there's the Deep Howl Navigator, which you use to find and play videos. You can download those videos to your local device and watch those without needing an internet connection. Um, but as, and, and also recording videos. So the capture app that we have, you can do all of your recording off in a corner of the plant that has no internet connectivity. But at some point, when you walk back into a range of your network connection, your Wi Fi or your cell, um, Deep Power will automatically detect that. And any uploads that you have queued will be uploaded. Um, but of course, if you want to edit a video, you do need to be uh, connected to the internet at that point. But, but recording and playing, certainly offline. Um, Douglas asked, uh, how is each SOP reviewed and approved? Great question. So we have built into the platform, the, um, into the work, into the editing workflow, the ability for you to assign reviewers. Um, there's also multiple different roles within Deep Power. There's, um, an organizational ad administrator. There's also a local site administrator. There's a publisher, which you can um, empower to create, edit, and publish. But the majority of people will probably only be viewers. They'll be watching videos that are made by the experts and those approved to uh, publish videos. So that's one way of controlling it. But just to finish what I started saying, during the video editing uh, workflow, you can certainly um, add reviewers. So um, Sarah and Steve, um, I could nominate to review my videos and check for validity and, and errors. 
before it ever reaches the uh, publication step. So I hope that answers your question. You see, can you all see why I'm so excited, right? I mean, just think of the questions that you have. Uh, I see Steve Fleshman was asking questions about NERMA. Think about introducing this concept to NERMA and how you, which is the Nuclear Information Record Management Association, and think about the routing of video procedures so that they would have 50-59 applicability reviews, um, technical evaluations, safety screenings, all the different things. Put in the video aspect on it, or think about a written procedure that instead of having just a warning identify a critical step, imagine having the video actually show you that critical step perform before the critical step is actually performed. Just think about all the opportunities there. Now, of course, this is what I hope that we bring to the table to help support Deep How and why you should see things coming from us looking for support from other places. I've already discussed this with the Procedure Professionals Association about a standard on developing where do you draw the line between a video that really supports training as compared to a video that is for a task-based human error prevention tool and a step-by-step -step document. We can think of that would even be different. Where should we draw the line between a video that's there to help uh, us, you know, assist in the performance of a human factor task but yet we still need written instructions. Think about how cool this whole concept is. And that's why I was saying in the normal evolution of things from 30,000 BC to where we are, we have a, there's a lot of work ahead of this, but even where it is right now, it's a running platform right now that in many industries that don't go as regulated as hard as nuclear does, or maybe some of the DOE things and NERC and, and the FERC and those different areas, that already it's up and running, you know what I mean? So, so this is gonna be uh, things that I think are gonna be an exciting tomorrow, you know? And I don't mean that, you know, overemphasize that, I'm just excited about it. I, I think this is a cool thing, you know? And, uh, and, and it's an answer to me, I called it the missing link to me. I, I think this is a missing link. So how are we gonna to work together? Uh, PSM and Deep Health Partnership will work together to develop the best blend of tools Video, written procedures focus on the human performance of the user. So our focus is going to be on the user and figure out what tool or combination of tools will help that person be most successful. So we'll be lending our consulting services to DeepHow and in the, in the DeepHow training platform to assure the video support regulatory compliance, consider human performance, and evaluate, uh, evaluate the chances of human performance errors. In conclusion, I'd like to say, as I'm sure we are all experiencing, our world is changing rapidly, right? You can't help but watch 24-hour news and see that. I think a couple of quotes sums this whole thing up. Albert Einstein, right? We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we've used when we created them. There it is, right? So we, we got to think, think a new way. Thomas Sowell wrote, sometimes it seems as if there are more solutions than problems. On closer scrutiny, it turns out that many of today's problems result from yesterday's solutions, right? So we got to keep that in mind, right? I think both of these quotes summarize the intent of today's Lunch and Learn. When you think of a procedure instruction, I think most of us will naturally think of a piece of paper with a lot of words. My challenge to you, though, is ask that same question to someone born after the creation of Facebook. I'm not thinking that they're thinking of a piece of paper with a lot of words. But us baby booners who are 60 years old, we're thinking of paper with too many words on it. And we've spent a lot of effort since 2006 on how to write things more concisely in the human factor. Now this is taking it a step even further, right? PSM slide about us, Deep How, which Stu has very eloquently discussed. Uh, we have a PPA certification class here in April of 2023. If anybody's interested in, there's details here. Uh, and then also, there's a 34th annual procedure symposium by the PPA uh, that's going to be held in Savannah. I got a chance to be there last week. Great place, great place to spend some time. And um, think about this. For all of you that are procedure writers today, ed editors, think if you're, more if you're interested in more information about upcoming human factored video procedure writer certification, send us an email. I would just, I'm just, we're gaining interest. We're checking to see what kind of interest is out there. But if you would like to be on that short list of, of names and say, hey, when we finally have all the nuts and bolts all figured out of, of what it really looks like and how to make this thing a very uh, well-worthy thing, 
I'm going to be hiring video procedure writers. I already, I already know it. I, I can tell you 2023 going to 2024, you will probably see advertisements from Procedure Solutions about people that are PPA certified writers that are also certified on how to take human factor videos. Because I think the PPA certified writers will be the best people to say, hey, we'll come in there and we'll videotape the stuff that you want or show you how to do it so you can be healthy on your own. I hope overall uh, this Lunch and Learn gave you some insight to something that I think uh, is, and we really would welcome any questions that you have, either the Stu directly or myself. And uh, again, thank you for taking your lunch with us. And I'm sorry we ran over by about 15 minutes, but I hope it was worth it. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. Anybody? Thank you. Um, yeah, I we do have actually quite a few questions. So I don't know if people want to stick around if I send them after. We'll, I do stick, around. Around. we'll stick around as long as you want to answer questions. So. Okay. Um, I'll read a few here um, from the Q&A that we got a little bit earlier. Um, so Sandy had asked, you mentioned APRs that are available are available. Is there an API to list slash access the video segment? What kind of API? Yep, great question. So we have, um, if you're familiar with web-based uh, REST APIs, we have published APIs that allow you to get information about the users on your system, all of the video workflows on your system, um, metadata about those video workflows, you know, um, you can even extract the text, that, uh, the subtitled text in German, if you wish to go down to that level of granularity. You can also extract all of the analytics um, about who's watched what video and when and for how long. So a lot of this stuff you can access if you're you know, happy to write scripts or programs to, to work with the API. Okay. Um, next question, uh, Jean asks, how much training does it take to use the video editing tool? Not very much at all. It's very intuitive. So our um, customer success department, they typically do customer onboarding in one hour. So you learn how to use all of the deep how tools in about 60 minutes. Obviously, like any tool, um, you need to then spend a little bit of time with it to um, increase your speed, but you, it's, it's not complicated to use. We've, we, we are a, a design led company. So um, all of our user experience um, is, is very um, judiciously designed. We have a design team of like, I think seven or eight people now. So we spend a lot of effort on the user experience. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud that it doesn't take too long to learn. It's much easier than using Final Cut Pro or, or something similar like that to, to edit videos, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, next question uh, from David. How accurate are the subtitle translations based on different dialects, video productions, and clarity of speakers? That's a great question. Um, so let me take the last point first, the clarity of speakers. So because DeepHow is, is geared towards um, end users that are in industrial environments, what we typically do is um, with, with our customers that, that um, we onboard, we um, either recommend or we send um, a particular brand of noise canceling headphone that works really well with the, uh, the smartphones or the smart uh, tablets that you use to record. And the expert will wear these Bluetooth noise canceling headphones. And we've, we've, we've shown that we can record an expert performing their task in a, an environment that's like almost 100 dB of, of noise, which is significant. And we can still do the speech um, recognition um, even in the most extreme environment. So, that's that's proven uh, to be uh, really well received by customers. The clarity of the speaking. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing you mean like regional accents. You know, if somebody has a real drawl or or a certain twang. Um, so it. 
for the most part, I would say it's pretty good. It's it's obviously not going to be perfect if the uh, the accent is really strong. Um, but we we have pretty good results and not many complaints from the end customers. Um, now, your third point, I think, was about language translation accuracy. So if you know anything about how these models are trained, uh, these large, they call them large language models, and they're trained based upon the availability of content on the internet. And you can imagine on the internet, um, there's an awful lot of English content that can be used to be trained. There's an awful lot of Chinese content on the internet that can be trained. Um, so the short answer is the, the higher the prevalence of the language on the internet that can be used to train these models um, is a good indication of the level of accuracy of the translation. So if you pick some um, very small uh, regional language, you know, in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's, it's not going to be anywhere near as good as if it's one of the dominant languages. But for most, I think DeepHow now supports something like uh, 15 languages that your experts can use to record their workflows. Um, so they certainly don't have to record them in English, you know, you, you can record them in Spanish, French, German, whatever your native uh, mother tongue is. Um, and then on the other side, if we want to translate that to languages, I think we support something like 25 languages, 25 of the most common languages. Um, so hope hope that helps. Okay, and then another question from uh, Stephen Fleshman. Um, is the AI created by DeepHow or does it use another AI like IBM Watson? No, no, it doesn't use IBM Watson, no. It's our own models, yes. We created our own models. Um, and then Sandy asks, do you have a searchable video library that can be searched by customized tags? We do indeed, yes. So let me talk a little bit about search. So I demonstrated um, there were the key terms that were extracted that you could search on and choose from that uh, left-hand column. There's a free text search, um, which essentially searches all of the subtitles or all of the titles of the video. You can also search based upon the author who, who created and published the video. Um, but even more so, we've leveraged the power of AI so that you can search also in the content. So to just to explain that a little bit more. So let me couch it in, in these terms. So for example, if you were, if you were searching for maybe a, a, a chef cooking some meat, um, what we're able to do inside of Deep How is we're, we're able to recognize that there is a chef that's cooking some meat. They may be cooking some fish, they may be cooking a steak, maybe chicken or bacon or something. And we can, um, we can abstract that to know that it's meat that's being cooked. And we can, as part of the search results, we can return videos that um, are showing you different types of meat being cooked, but also in different languages. So if there was a Chinese chef that was cooking some fish or a French chef that was cooking uh, a chicken dish, we would also return those. And then you could watch the Chinese chef cooking, but you could um, have the subtitles translated into English so that you could actually understand what the Chinese chef was saying. So it's, it's a pretty powerful, search and this is where the AI really starts to pay dividends. Okay, um, let's see, I have two more in the Q&A. Um, this one was more for Steve, which you kind of answered already, but just in case. Um, Douglas was asking, are there any need for remote workers such as reviewers for this? You know, Doug, you used the word need in there. I wouldn't say that there was a need. I would say is that there will be a need, I would assume. I, I would think that any type of reviewer platform where there happens to be procedures uh, written in the written text or by video, 
Um, many of the com companies are so multinational today, for Exxon <laughs> Mobil, for example, where engineering resources may be in India. So there may be that the fact that you have a, a dedicated engineer that's the subject matter expert for the certain pump operation. And this video was taken on how to operate a pump. And then you want that engineer to bless off the video to say that the pump is being operated properly. So maybe that video would then be reviewed in the workflow by that engineer in India uh, for some uh, video that was created in Houston, right? So I, I would think that it will have the ability to do that. The need, I think, is going to be very client-based on, on what their criteria is for their, you know, on what, what, what's going to best suit their needs. I don't know if that answers it properly or not. And then another question from Douglas, um, can it have dual subtitles as with BNPP, several different backgrounds or operators such as US, um, Emirati and other nationalities? That's interesting. Um, so what they're saying, so, Stu, is that there may be cases where they need to have the subtitle. I, I think what, what he doesn't see is that the person who's actually playing the video would have the ability to select the uh, the subtitle language based on their needs are. So there wouldn't be a need for actually a dual uh, subtitle as much as whoever is actually viewing that video would have the ability to have the subtitles displayed in their native language. Is that, is that the, did I say that okay? That's totally correct, Steve. All right, and then just one more question that we have um, from Beth. Um, is there a way to dub a voiceover in another language to allow the viewer to hear in their preferred language while focusing on the subject of the video rather than having to read the subtitle? Uh, can, can you say that to me again, please, Sarah? Sorry. Yeah, is there is there a way to dub a voiceover in another language to allow the viewer to hear in their preferred language while focusing on the subject of the video rather than having to read the subtitle? Uh, so yes, there is. <clears throat> As when you upload a video uh, to Deep Hell, uh, you have the opportunity also to make some edits to the video. And one of those uh, types of edits is if you wish to do a voiceover. Our original intent was that if, if um, you know, if I'm recording the video and I accidentally either drop an F bomb or you know, or curse, um, or perhaps I said, um, you know, ten pounds per square inch when I really meant to say a hundred pounds per square inch. Deep how. Uh, has a feature which allows you to go in and voice over or re-record over those, you know, so I, I can silence out my F-bomb or I can re-record over the 10 and say 100. Um, now, you could that, take that to the logical extreme where you replace the entire voice track with, um, with a voiceover in a different language, and you can certainly do that. Um, I've done that before on several Deep Power videos with customers. So the short answer is yes. Any other questions out there, uh, sir? Looks like that's all the questions we had. All right, well, let's make it a wrap. So Stu, we'll be back in touch. And thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. And we'll see you guys again soon.